Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining our webinar where we would discuss what changes are coming with the SQF Code Edition 9. In this webinar, we will discuss SQF Code Edition 9, identify some major changes, and detail how it will impact you. This webinar will be hosted by Brian Neal, Eurofins Technical Manager, and Tammy Van Buren, Compliance Manager for Safe Quality Food Institute. I'm Kelly Duncan, and I'll be helping coordinate this webinar. Before we begin, I'll let you know more about how this webinar will run. This webinar is being recorded. The slides and recording will be available for you within three business days. A short Q&A session will follow the presentation to answer any viewer submitted questions. During the webinar, you may submit questions you have using the webinar sidebar menu. Select the questions tab, type in your question, then hit the enter key on your keyboard. Remember, you can submit questions throughout this webinar. Brian and Tammy, you may begin your presentation. Thank you, Kelly, and welcome everyone to our, our uh, presentation this morning. Um, first off, just to kind of get started, I want to talk a little bit about the Eurofins food assurance offerings. Um, I know you're not here for that, but just to kind of quickly talk about them. Of course, we do the auditing services, um, certification, consulting, labeling services, training, and e-learning. And as we get through the very end, I'll kind of talk about how Eurofins can kind of help you guys if you need a little help moving to that um, addition on level to kind of get those systems in place. And if you need any help, just understanding if you have everything you need. So we offer all these services to help you get what you need in your, your daily lives, at least with your businesses. Uh, another new service we offer is a, called Safer at Work, and this is all around COVID-19 and ensuring your workplace is safe and healthy for your employees um, and then your visitors, your customers, things like that. So we offer different services for Safer at Work around COVID-19 verification. And if you'd like more information about any of our services, please let me know. Um, real quick, and you all know about this, about SQF and how it all works in the process of the flow here. So just, just quickly, um, just so you know about the SQF certification process. Of course, first you learn about the code. And if you're new to SQF, that's what we're doing today, learning a little bit about Edition 9. Uh, and all of this is available on the SQF website. Um, after you learn about it, you figure out what you need to do to move forward. You register um, for an SQF certification. And that's with your certification body of choice, of course, Eurofins being one of those. After you do that, you prepare for your audit with your certification body um, to kind of help you lead down that path, what you need to do, when you need to do it, scheduling, things like that. And then the certification body will, will schedule an auditor to come on site, do that audit for you. Um, and then, you know, the whole process with that closing nonconformances, corrective actions, the audit review, and then issuing, of course, the certification. And then the cycle starts over. Very good. Poll question for everybody, real quick as we get started here. Have you reviewed the key changes to SQF Edition 9 as it relates to your area? If you just want to answer that quickly, and then we just kind of get an idea where everybody's at and we can move forward and get into the beef of it all. And I know that. The, the code has been published for a few months now, so hopefully everyone has had a chance to go in and look at your respective code and kind of see what the changes are and start working on that, especially if you have audits coming up in May, uh, May, June time frame as, as that kind of, whenever that kind of gets going. So we should be able to get that closed up and hopefully we have some good results. Yep, it looks like 57% said yes and 43% said no. Interesting. Okay, good, good. Well, I'm glad everybody's here. That way we can gotta, kind of get familiar with some of the changes, and then that way you, that will help you lead into, you know, doing that investigative work and get John download, downloading those codes and doing, you know, your gap assessments and things like that. Okay, very good. Thank you. Okay, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Tammy, who will walk us through the next few slides and kind of fill us in on Edition 9. Go ahead, Tammy. 
All right. Thank you all for uh, joining and, and uh, being here to listen about Edition 9. Uh, I am quite the talker and I do enjoy talking about our SQF codes and, and particularly about Edition 9 that's coming up. Uh, so I'm going to try to, you know, keep us within our a lot of time frame here so that we have lots of uh, opportunity for questions at the end. Um, but I, as we go along, I'm going to try to answer as many frequently asked questions as I can uh, so that uh, we, we uh, you know, can answer all your questions today. Uh, as you see there, implementation May 24th. So uh, one of our most frequently asked questions there uh, is, are we going to move that date? you know, due to the pandemic. And, you know, we have answered that, you know, um, the same. It, it is not our intention uh, to change that date. Uh, May 24th is the day. So we will be going live with edition nine. And uh, any audits conducted after that day uh, will be to edition nine, with the exception of any surveillance audits uh, that are needed as a result of an audit that was done to edition 8.1. So everything else though will be edition nine, and we'll talk about some of the changes like the uh, elimination of the document audit. Um, that's another uh, frequently asked question that we get is, you know, if I have my doc audit before May 24th, can I have my on-site audit after May 24th to edition 8.1? And the answer is no. So um, with edition nine, there will be no more document audit required. So May 24th, all on-site audits will be to uh, edition nine after that. Uh, some people have asked, hey, my audits due end of April, 1st of May. Can I have an edition nine audit? And and unfortunately, no. Uh, May 24th is the day. So uh, before that, it will have to be to edition 8.1. But you could always work with your certification body. And if it's within your audit window, maybe you can uh, hold off to that May 24th date. So as you see there, the codes, uh, they're the covers of the updated uh, 11 codes there looks really great, nice and fresh. And uh, I, I love the what we've done with the new uh, covers. And um, I think it's um, just, just a great uh, look to our code. So um, I know a lot of you all may be sites um, that are here, but I wanted to kind of throw a question back to Brian there. So as a certification body, you know, what have you all done to prepare for that May 24th date uh, when we go live with edition nine. Yeah, thanks, Tammy. So what we've done at, at Eurofins is, of course, updating our systems and things like that, but also developed the training um, against SQF edition nine for our, our auditors and our office staff and everybody involved with the certification body, just to make sure everybody's up to date on the changes and the new codes and what's required and you know the new look, of course, and where to find all this good stuff. So yeah, that's that's one thing we've done is how to you know, develop the training and also just our, during our quarterly calibration calls, kept everybody up to date on the changes all the way from you know, issuance of the code. So it's um, hopefully it all goes smoothless, you know, just smooth and seamless in, in, in May. Yeah, I believe it will. I think we're uh, all gonna be ready and we're just gonna make that you know, smooth transition on May 24th. So, all right, so let's take a look at how we've kind of reorganized uh, those new codes. Uh, you'll see, so edition 8.1 there on the left. Um, the, the bottom uh, three there, the food retail, food service, fundamentals, those have not changed. So uh, for edition nine, we did not look at those um, three codes. Um, so everything was focused on the ones there at the top. Uh, we had primary production, we had food manufacturing, we had storage and distribution and food packaging, and then of course the quality code. And as you can see there on the right, uh, we have expanded. So we have more codes uh, starting with edition nine. And so the primary code where it was one has now been divided into three different codes, primary animal, primary plant, and aquaculture. You can see there also we have added a food sector category number two, uh, that is for indoor ag operations, and um, that is something new. Uh, you will see food sector category four there, the pack houses, has been moved from the manufacturing code to the primary production code. So that's a change for uh, edition nine. And then you will see the, 
the manufacturing code has been divided into five different codes. We have animal product, food, dietary supplements, pet food, and animal feed. And then, of course, our storage and distribution and food packaging, uh, while got a fresh new look, it is, they are still the same food sector categories. And then the quality code has been updated so that any GFSI recognized standard um, can now be certified to the SQF quality code, where in the past you had to actually have an SQF food safety certification. So, all right. Uh, Brian, I got another question for you. So with all yeah. those changes, that we've made to, um, you know, adding the food sector category two and moving four and breaking out into those separate manufacturing codes, you know, what what's the process for existing sites? So if I'm already certified and I, I'm coming up on edition nine, you know, what do I need to do? Do I need to call my CB? Yeah, luckily, sure. Yeah, luckily SQF I mean, you guys have made it really easy on everybody as far as publishing these codes, and it's pretty self-explanatory. And then, as you guys register in RepositTrack, you'll you know your FSC will will you'll select that, and the checklist we download will automatically populate everything we need um, according to the code that it falls into. And of course, we've made changes in our system to reflect the the, the code and naming the nomenclature of it all. So when we reach out to you on an annual basis to go ahead and set up those audit dates, we'll reconfirm everything and make sure we have the correct um, you know, name of the code on there. But we've had plenty of sites already reach out to us and ask us questions about the codes and which code they go into. And you know, so it's it's really great to have that interaction between all the sites and you know the back and forth. But but you won't necessarily need to reach out to us um, unless you have questions about it because it's all kind of done on the back end automatically for us. Thank you. So let's jump into talking about some of those changes. So uh, the code has a part A and a part B. Each one of our codes do. Uh, part A has some really great information in it. And, you know, I was uh, previously an SQF practitioner and uh, in a couple of different sites. And I didn't realize how much great information is in part A. So I encourage you, if you haven't read part A, you know, people, you know, will typically jump into part B and look for those uh, changes. But, you know, part A is a great source of uh, some good information there. So uh, let's just talk about the part A changes. And there were a few. Um, change uh, the scoring from 10 points to five uh, for a major nonconformity. You know, and a lot of people were asking us the question, why would you do that? You know, why would you, you know, reduce the impact that a major nonconformity has? Um, but, you know, our thinking is that, um, you know, scores are actually, you know, may go down instead of going up. Whereas, you know, a lot of people think, oh, well, scores are going to go up. But, you know, our thinking is we may see it actually go down because um, we want auditor, auditors to really start considering um, those major nonconformities uh, when it's a system failure. So we review audit reports um, as a technical team at SQFI on a regular basis. And so we will see where individuals have, you know, written, you know, three minor nonconformances in one section. And we really want them to start looking at that to see if that's more of a systemic issue um, and, and, you know, assign, not being afraid to sign those, assign those majors um, due to the 10 point deduction. So we're going to monitor that closely and we're going to see how that goes. But, um, you know, I, I really think we're going to see an impact there on that. Uh, we did modify the requirement for unannounced audits. So previously it was once in every three year audit cycle. And now we've done away with the audit cycles and it will just be one in every three years. So it'll make it real simple for the site, for the CB to figure out whether they're due for an unannounced audit. You just look back at your two previous and if they were announced, then you're due for an unannounced audit. So it's gonna make tracking and keeping up that a lot easier. As I mentioned previously, we did remove that desk audit um, for initial certifications. So uh, a site can go right into having the on-site audit. Later in this um, webinar, we're gonna talk about some other options if you just feel that you need some assistance uh, to, to make sure you're ready before you do that on-site audit. So we'll talk about that at the end. Um, the audit duration table, uh, that's probably one that is impacting the certification bodies. 
uh, and they are having to, you know, decide how they're going to verify the length of the audit uh, for each site. So, so that was a that was a big change for them. Uh, we've also included the option for remote audit activities, and what that says is, you know, if you have a two-day audit, then you are allowed to request up to half of that time to be done remotely. So if I have a two-day audit, I could have one day done remotely and one day on-site with the auditor, and that's included in uh, Part A. Clarified activities when a site is suspended or fails an audit, and we added that if-then table for easy reference. Uh, we didn't really change any of the requirements there, but we just uh, clarified it, and uh, hopefully it will make it easier for um, sites and CBs to follow uh, in the event that someone, you know, unfortunately has to get suspended. So um, how about anything else, Brian, from, you know, a CB or an auditor viewpoint there uh, that you see, um, you know, is, is going to make an impact on you guys? Yeah, I like the, the scoring change just because, like you said, it, that 10 points is a big, scary number to not only sites, but auditors. I mean, uh, uh, you know, they they see that 10-point de deduction and and you know it shouldn't be that way but they're they may be afraid to issue that major non-conformance so i like that five point major non-conformance scoring um and and do agree that we'll probably see scores go down because we'll start seeing more of those major non-conformances which should probably happen um to kind of you know put the severity of those those issues out there and then of course i think one of the biggest and it can kind of go both ways is the removal of the desk audit I know that some people like that and some people don't just because the desk on it can identify a few things, but you know, it, it cuts down on the duration, just like with the below there and, and helps helps out with that. So there's good and bad, but but I, I like all these these changes for sure. I think they're really great. Yeah, me too. I, I'm very excited for uh, May to get here. So, all right, so let's jump into those uh, Part B changes. And, you know, this first bullet point, I know people are not going to be happy about that one. There are numbering changes, and I am so sorry, but, you know, we, we felt like we needed to do some numbering changes um, to help the sections uh, flow better. And so, uh, you know, we've had a lot of, you know, comments around numbering changes, you know, asking why we would do that. And, uh, you know, we try to minimize that. Um, but at the same time, I also, um, you know, encourage sites to really look at the way that they use the numbering system. You know, some have their documents numbered according to the sections, you know, that they go to. And, you know, that's not an SQF requirement. So, you know, I would challenge sites to really look at their document control system and, you know, how can they do that a little bit differently so that numbering changes don't impact them uh, as, uh, you know, it's, it's going to happen, unfortunately, sometimes. So uh, reduction of sections and clauses in the different codes uh, and, you know, on the different checklists. And the word register is now referred to as a list. Some people didn't fully understand what the word register uh, meant. And, you know, it, it is a term that we don't necessarily use often. You know, we, we're more familiar with a list. So when we talk about a list, people know what that is. So you know, what kind of impact do you see from some of these changes, um, Brian, as far as, you know, I know you're an auditor. So, you know, what about reducing those sections and clauses? What do you think? I think that's really great, not only for auditors, because it will, you know, help shorten the time we, we have to stare at that checklist and we can focus more on, you know, the processes and things like that. But also for the sites, because, I mean, it's kind of the same thing. And, and to your point with the numbering changes and you know, I always tell, I have sites ask me, well, how should we put together our, our SQF plan or our programs, our processes? And a lot of sites do number them according to the, to the, to the code, but just make it where it works for you. Don't, don't make it where it works for the auditor to make it easy for the auditor. Of course, you want to make a smooth process during the audit, but make, make it, uh, your programs and processes work for you. Um, and if that's putting the SQF number on it, but for, for quick reference, that's great. And if you decide you don't want to do it, then that's great too. Us auditors are pretty uh, resilient and we can come in and adapt just the same. So, um, but yeah. Okay, so let's let's jump into some changes. Uh, we've got a top nine for edition nine that I'll cover just quickly because we're gonna dig in a little bit deeper on some of these um, later on in the webinar. 
So, you know, the addition of food safety culture, that number one there, that's a big one. And we've probably had more questions, more comments about food safety culture. Probably the most frequently asked question is, how is the auditor going to audit me for food safety culture? And I have prepared a brand new slide, first time on a webinar anywhere that you're going to see this slide at the end uh, of the webinar here that talks about food safety culture and some of the things that the auditor will, you know, more than likely look at when they're trying to audit that new requirement. Uh, we, you know, had a little bit of change to the contract manufacturers, you know, in addition 8.1, we looked at them like they were all the same. And in addition 9, we broke it out so that high risk uh, is looked at a little bit differently than low risk or uh, differently than those that are just, you know, storage and distribution. Uh, new requirement for product changeover and label reconciliation. You will see labels mentioned in several changes in addition nine. So as we're going through the different sections, you will see those. Uh, internal testing and sampling mentioned there in four and five. Training requirements as it relates to that. So we're going to talk about those, um, you know, testing and sampling requirements uh, for your internal labs, uh, particularly. Uh, and then uh, additional requirement for adequate ventilation. You know, we did add that. Um, and, you know, I, just some inf uh, interesting information that I saw over the weekend as I was, you know, looking through some non-conformance data. And yes, I am a data nerd, I guess. And uh, Sunday, I was looking at non-conformance data. I will admit that. So, um, you know, ventilation has shown up in our critical list of non-conformances every year for the last three years. That's the only clause that showed up uh, as a critical in 2018, 2019, and 2020. Th so that's how important we felt like that the focus uh, on ventilation needed to be. So there is an additional requirement there. Uh, added a requirement for ambient air testing for high risk processes only. And we'll touch on that again. And then accommodate those preventive controls and storage and distribution and feed standards, um, you know, to go along with, uh, you know, HACCP is required. Um, but there's also um, some opportunities there for preventive controls. Uh, and additional requirements for water testing and primary produce. Um, think those leafy greens that we have seen recalls uh, over the last several years, time and time again, uh, for contamination uh, that led back to water. So um, we beefed up the water testing in the primary produce uh, code as well. So that's our top nine. So let's dig a little bit deeper into some of those. Um, so primary plant, um, you can see some GFSI additions there um, and some things HACCP based around pack houses uh, and significant incidents, uh, corrective and preventive action there. Uh, environmental monitoring added. Um, GFSI also had some requirements around chemical label compliance and um, visitor cross-contamination, water quality, you know, as it relates to leafy greens, I mentioned, and then some commodity-specific SOPs for har harvesting. Animal feed, if you're uh, an animal feed supplier, a uh, HACCP there, but also a reference to pre preventive controls. And then we remove some requirements. So I'm very excited about our animal feed and our pet food codes because, you know, in the past, they were all a part of manufacturing. And there are some things that just aren't applicable uh, to animal feed and uh, pet food. So we removed the CIP reference, removed sensory, because I'm pretty sure nobody was doing sensory on animal feed. Uh, we removed the ice requirement there. And then, um, you know, the cold storage and thawing reference is now applicable to the ingredients and not the feed itself. Okay, pet food. We did change where uh, the allergen requirement uh, was there, and it's now called identity preser preserved foods. And um, this is just better for uh, identifying those hazards that are applicable to pets. And you know, think grain free. And uh, it's no longer a mandatory requirement um, because we've removed, um, you know, the we're no longer calling it that allergen. Yeah, Tammy, just like what you said, I, I'm excited to see that these are broken out from the, you know, human food manufacturing because there's, you know, so many differences and things like that. So it's good for 
for a lot of a uh, lot of people who have these two processes. So it's good to see. Yeah, I'm excited about these. Okay, food packaging. Um, I cannot tell you how um, great this this change to Edition Nine is for food packaging. There were a lot of great people on that working group that helped to develop and clarify the language. So it really is applicable to food sector packaging. You know, in the past, it may have been more, you know, taking the wording for food manufacturing and, you know, inserting the word food packaging. And now that language is really just specific to food sector packaging. So um, I think they did a fantastic job on, you know, uh, updating uh, to edition nine for food packaging. Uh, there's a little bit of a requirement around quarantine product that was added. Um, environmental monitoring uh, was very uh, prescriptive. Um, and very specific to paper packaging, you know, previously. So, so that's been corrected. And then also some additional language clarification around the use of recycled material. So very exciting on the food packaging code. Uh, storage and distribution, um, more customized language for your DCs. Again, added a reference to preventive controls. And then also, um, you know, around 12.6.2.5 there, uh, those methods and responsibilities uh, applied to processes such as thawing, slacking, labeling to make sure that they don't uh, present a risk to, to product safety or, or loss of traceability in the event of labeling. Yeah, perfect. This is another one um, I'm kind of glad to see some changes on because, you know, the storage and distribution is so different from any type of manufacturing. So it's good to see a few changes here as well. I would agree. All right, so now let's focus on um, food manufacturing and we're gonna go down through the sections. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because again, we've got about 15 more minutes of the presentation and then we wanna uh, save that time at the end for uh, questions and answers. So just to hit the highlights here, you'll see edition 8.1 on the left, you'll see edition nine on the right. So I've bolded a few things there. Again, food safety culture um, references to that was added in there and I'm gonna dig deep into food safety culture at the end. So we'll come back to that one. Um, added the requirement for substitute for the SQF practitioner. You know, some people are like, oh, that's a new requirement, having a substitute. Um, but if you'll remember in addition 8.1, you know, it always said you had to have backups for key personnel. And so your SQF practitioner was a key personnel, you needed backup, but here it just specifies um, that that backup or that substitute practitioner needs to meet those requirements for an SQF practitioner. Uh, and then we moved crisis management planning. Here's one of the renumbering. We moved crisis management uh, to uh, 2.6. And so we'll talk about that here in a minute, um, but we felt it flowed better with uh, recalls and withdrawals. And so, um, so we'll talk about that in a minute. Not a lot of changes there in 2.2, um, just one minor um, wording added there. Okay, 2.3, we changed the uh, name of that. It was specification and product development. Now it's called specifications, formulations, realization, and supplier approval. So um, here's our first area where we really, you know, added in some requirements around finished product labels. You know, they have to be accurate, comply with relevant legislation, and be approved by qualified company personnel. So um, as you're, you know, looking at new or updated finished product labels, somebody has to be approving those and making sure that they're accurate um, in, in all regards. And so, um, just a little bit of a, a hint on why there was so much emphasis put on labeling uh, for edition nine. Uh, the number one reason for recalls for the last several years has been unidentified allergens. And when the sites who uh, were involved in those recalls went back and dug into root causes, what they found was a lot of it was 
traced back to labeling and the approval of labels and making sure that the information on the labels uh, matched the formulation that was going into the label. Um, so you will see labels show up in about three different places, I think, for addition line. As I mentioned previously, commands, uh, they've been broken out a little bit and uh, then approved supplier moved uh, to 2.3.4 as well from 2.4.4. And then under 2.4, um, not, you know, a lot, it kind of flows the same way there, um, but product sampling now is in 2.4 and uh, testing and analysis does include that reference to internal as well as external labs and that proficiency testing is now in 2.4, uh, formally in 2.5. And again, I have a new slide for you guys at the end of this um, webinar, never before seen. So you all are getting a first look at it um, to um, help explain proficiency testing. I know proficiency testing is not new for edition nine, but it goes hand in hand with that internal lab requirement. Um, so we're gonna talk about that here at the end. 2.5, um, not really many changes there. We did move some things into 2.4. Um, your product ID uh, trace withdrawal and recall has been renamed to product traceability and crisis management. And so there's crisis management new home moved from 2.1 and then again here's some more labeling requirements we're emphasizing checks during operations to make sure the correct product or the correct formulation is going in the correct package and has the correct label on it so again going back to the you know cause for recalls uh, procedures uh, also to make sure that the label use is reconciled i've had a lot of frequently asked questions about this one how do I reconcile my labels and do I really have to hand count everything? And so my response there is um, label reconciliation can take on different forms. So hand counting is, is definitely a, a method of label reconciliation, um, but there are lots of others, you know, cycle counting, way counting, you know, there are other methods of reconciliation besides hand counting and you just need to have a process in place um, that you can demonstrate to the auditor that you meet the requirement and that as it says here inconsistencies can be investigated and resolved so come up with what method works for your particular uh, product and, and then demonstrate to the auditor that it meets the requirements okay not a lot of changes there. You can see 2.7, 2.8, 2.8 though, again, additional uh, you know, requirements around verification and reconciliation of labels again. Then in 2.9, you'll see that 2.9 was really consolidated from you know, several different um, sections down to two training requirements and you have to have a training program. And then you will see some additional requirements around specific tasks like sampling and testing, environmental monitoring, um, allergen management, food defense, and food fraud. Okay, so let's get into module 11 uh, or the, you know, GMP module here and look at those key changes. You'll see, um, you know, 11.1 grew a lot, but 11 Point two shrunk. <laughs> so uh, we just kind of moved some things around again for better flow um, and to, you know, kind of consolidate and, you know, get things together that should should have been together, you know, all along. So, um, you know, you can look at those, but no major changes there, just a little bit of restructuring. Then you get to 11.3 again not you know not a, a huge uh you know change there but again you know staff amenities does include change rooms toilets break rooms clothing uh was changed to clothing and personal effects um and you know then really no changes in 11.4 either yeah tammy just a quick note all these combining and and changing i i think it's good for everyone because it helps um, if we have an issue on the plant, as an auditor, for example, nonconformance, it's we don't have to decide is the signage nonconformance in this one or this one or this one. So, or you know, so it helps us pinpoint these issues and, and helps the site too. So you don't have to try to 
reference all these different clauses and elements and then within the code it's all now placed into one absolutely that's a great point brian so yeah we mentioned those hand washing signages there so you know combining it all into one um just just helps the auditor helps the site um, and i think that is a, a great point um, so we've got water, ice, and air. Uh, there was a new clause uh, added under ice supply. And, you know, again, this is one of those changes that really isn't a change. You know, it was there, you know, um, because you had to have an approved supplier program for all of your ingredients. This is just to serve as a reminder that if you're purchasing ice, it's an ingredient. So it should come from an approved supplier and it should be included in your um, food safety risk assessment. So, you know, people say, well, that's a new clause, but it, it was really there. It just was something that was easily forgotten. So we added it into ice supply so, so that people remember that, you know, ice is an ingredient uh, if you're purchasing it and uh, that it needs to come from an approved supplier. Uh, and then not a lot of changes really in um, storage and transport. Um, new clause there talking about, um, you know, uh, preventing cross-contamination risk, um, talking about storage of chemicals. That's another one that I think was kind of consolidated. You know, we talked about storage of chemicals when it talks about pest prevention and storage of chemicals when it talks about cleaning chemicals. So it just you know all added together for a better flow um and but other than that no real major changes under storage and transport okay um separation of functions there you can see it kind of got a little bit shorter um, but we did add some things in like ambient air in high risk areas we've talked about that one already um and that's one of those changes that really came about uh after the um the, the public comment period. So, you know, I would like to encourage you all to make sure that um, when you have an opportunity to make comments on future editions, uh, then, you know, please do that because we do listen to your comments and we do make changes. Uh, when this first came out, it was ambient air should be tested everywhere. And, and then um, it, you know, the comments came back and said, well, it really should just be for high risk areas. So we did make that change. And uh, and, and so I think it, it was a great change as a result of your comments. Uh, there is a new clause around some of those materials and uh, equipment parts that can wear or deteriorate over time. You should be inspecting those things like gaskets and rubber parts and things. Um, and then uh, we did move, uh, the uh, a little bit around there, the on-site lab that was, you know, moved to uh, section 11.2 and then uh, waste disposal was, uh, you know, moved up there. So, and a new clause added for GFSI requirement uh, regarding the removal and storage of wastewater, if that's applicable to you. So those are the key changes there. Um, here's the most frequently commented code requirement. So as I mentioned, when we were doing the public comments, um, these were the five things that people had the most comments or questions about. So again, food safety culture, still getting to that one. Um, you'll see that pop up in the next slide here. Uh, ambient air testing, I talked about that. The contract manufacturers, um, clarifying the use of um, other GFSI standards um, for those contract manufacturers, uh, the requirement around the internal labs and, you know, making sure that you're, um, you know, performing that sampling and testing methods in accordance with 17025. You don't have to be certified to 17025. Um, but you do have to be doing some things in accordance. And again, I mentioned previously um, the proficiency testing, which is not a new requirement, but that goes along with that ISO 17025. Uh, and then requirements again for label reconciliation. So lots of comments around that as well. All right, food safety culture, here it is. I've been building up, I've been telling you all about this, and I said, I promised, you're gonna see a new slide. So um, here's the requirement under 2.1.1.2 on food safety culture, and there are six bullet points there. Um, and you know what I've been telling people all along when they say food safety culture, it's a new requirement. Well, you know, in my opinion, it was always inherently in the code, 
um, but we just pulled it all together into this uh, requirement here. And so you'll see things about you know, documentation, communication, food safety objectives, performance measures, um, resources, um, you know, making sure your SQF systems uh, implemented, maintained there, uh, making sure staff uh, informed, you know, making sure they're positively encouraged to notify management if there are actually any issues or potential food safety issues, and making sure they're empowered to resolve those. So that's what the code says. And so let's break that down. Our most frequently asked question um, has been, how's the auditor going to audit food safety culture? So um, one of the things when we train auditors here at SQFI, uh, we tell them uh, to go to Rio. So when they're auditing, they should go to Rio. So I thought, you know what, for food safety culture, I'm gonna go to Rio. And so Rio stands for records, interviews, and observations. So let's look at records there. So um, food safety uh, objectives and performance measures. That was mentioned. So they're going to look at that. They're going to look at your organization chart to see the resources that you have available. Capital project plan. You know, are, are you investing in food safety? So they would look for that. Internal audit reports, GMP audit reports. You know, what are you identifying as issues within your program? You know, recognition programs, you know, are you recognizing people when they're, you know, doing a good job, when they're identifying and resolving issues? Um, unfortunately, the disciplinary process, you know, it's always concerning to me when, you know, I talk to, and I've talked to several quality managers that says, oh, we never, you know, you know, look at disciplining anyone when they violate our food safety uh, processes and procedures. And, you know, for me, you know, sometimes even just a one-on-one -on -one conversation in the quality manager's meeting uh, or in the quality manager's office is enough discipline um, to, to, you know, really reinforce that we need to follow those food safety processes. Uh, food safety and quality records there. Some of the ones that I would look at would be pest siding logs, uh, foreign material findings, glass and brittle plastic breakage reports, trailer inspections, those records that show that your employees, your team members are identifying those issues. Um, you know, if, if I go into a site and I see a pest siding log that's been blank uh, for the last, you know, 12 months, I'm concerned because, you know, are your personnel aware that you want them to identify when you see a pest uh, in the plant. And so, um, so yeah, so I look for those types of records, training records, job descriptions, you know, making sure that people understand their, um, you know, what they're supposed to do as far as food safety goes. And, and uh, you know, are they trained to, to support that process? So I don't know about you, um, you know, Brian, but are there any records listed there that are new to SQF? that would make this a new requirement? Or, you know, is there anything else that maybe that you would look for um, when you start auditing Edition 9 for food safety culture? Yeah, much of this, like you said, it was already in place. So us as auditors were already looking at, you know, most of this this stuff. I would say one of the, the biggest things we, of course, didn't look at was be the disciplinary process and records of that. If someone, you know, making sure there's, there's a process in place, if, you know, they do something against a food safety plan, um, is there a disciplinary process around it? And if so, are they following that? So I would say out of out of the things you've listed here, that's definitely the biggest change uh, for us as auditors. And the rest of it, you know, we, we kind of already looked at that in one form or another. So it's, uh, yeah, I would say that's the biggest change for us. Yeah. So, yeah, in interviews, I've got some questions there. You know, are you meeting your food safety objectives? How do you know? Um, do you ever need help to get something done? And who's your backup? You know, this next one is one of my favorite questions to ask. Would you feel safe feeding your product to your family? And uh, that to me is just an indicator that you have a good food safety culture. Um, what happens if someone violates food safety procedures? That kind of goes back to, you know, recognizing and, you know, discipline, disciplining when there is an issue. And, you know, explain a time when you told management about a food safety issue and what was their response. So, um, you know, I, those are some of the questions that I came up with. 
Brian, anything else that you would typically ask to, you know, identify a food safety culture? Yeah, I would say just to go along with your first one, asking if they know what those objectives are, because, you know, they may be written by a corporate person or someone in upper management and doesn't get passed down to, you know, the individuals you're interviewing. So it'd be good to know if they even, you know, are aware of those objectives and how they should be handling them and, and helping meet those objectives. Great. Uh, and then under observations there. So, you know, is the company transparent with their performance in, information? So, you know, are there, you know, you know, charts and graphs and things um, that's uh, posted or, you know, running on computer screens or, you know, TV screens um, to inform, you know, your personnel on their performance. Do people appear rushed? So I'm just observing and I'm watching and are, are people, are, you know, rushed? Do they, you know, pay more attention to, you know, filling out documents rather than to, you know, doing the uh, the food safety checks or, you know, watching, you know, the product that's coming down the line? Uh, are they completing tasks above the minimum requirement? So maybe you have a, a requirement that says you sweep the floor, you know, at the end of every shift. But do you see employees grabbing those brooms and sweeping up throughout the day? Um, are they going above and beyond the minimum requirements? You know, do employees seem hesitant to answer questions? So, you know, I used to uh, always enjoy, you know, telling the auditors, ask whoever you want, whatever you want. And, um, you know, I was never afraid of what my employees might say. And so they were always very, you know, forthcoming with, with any auditors uh, that were in the plant. Um, do you see personnel pick up trash off the floor? You know, that was that's a big one for me, you know, to, to watch and see, you know, the plant manager all the way down to, you know, somebody that's, um, you know, driving a fork truck to get off and, you know, pick up trash and just, you know, do they take pride in their, their work area? So to me, that's a good indicator of food safety culture. And I always sum up food safety culture as, you know, people doing the right thing, even if, they think nobody's watching. So uh, anything else to add there, um, Brian, before we go on and cover our last topic? No, I think like you just said, it's, it's, it's basic, just looking at the overall system. Um, if something gets identified on an internal audit, for example, do they take action on it? How long does it take to get action taken on it? You know, is upper management willing to spend the money to get big projects completed? And just looking at that um, upper support and just process, process overall, I think that's kind of where you, where you would see all these points. Absolutely. Okay, so let's dig into this last one that I promised we were gonna talk about. Internal labs, I know we've got, we're running out of time, we wanna to get to those Q and A's. So internal labs, um, lots of discussion, lots of questions around that requirement uh, about the internal labs that are used to conduct input environmental or product analysis, sampling and testing methods shall be in accordance with the applicable requirements of ISO IEC 17025, including annual proficiency testing. So again, proficiency testing is not new, um, but uh, we did add in um, the applicable, um, you know, methods and things uh, as well. So, um, so let's, what, what does this mean? So let's look at this next slide and talk about proficiency testing. Um, we did, however, add a new definition. So that's another area. If you have not checked it out, I would strongly encourage you to look at Appendix 2, which is the glossary. We've added some new definitions in there and the, the glossary just adds some clarification on, you know, some of the requirements. And I would, I would certainly, you know, suggest that you look there first uh, when you're looking for, you know, some of the clarifications. Um, but a new addition, a uh, new definition, uh, we added proficiency testing and I have uh, underlined some words there and then I kind of threw it down into a table because I'm real big about, you know, tables and charts and, you know, making it visual. So, um, so it's interlaboratory comparisons calibrates the performance of lab personnel and, and in process testers. So I get lots of questions of, well, what if my testing is not done in a lab? Well, what we're really looking at focusing on here is the personnel that's doing the testing, not the physical location of the testing in your plant. You may be doing these tests online and, and that would still qualify um, under this. So, um, and it's those people that conduct micro chemical or physical analysis of ingredients, materials, 
work in progress, finished products, and the processing environment. So proficiency testing is not training. It is calibration. So you're not trained. I mean, obviously your personnel need to be trained, um, but proficiency testing calibrates them against other people that are doing the same type of testing. Um, it is not intralab comparison, it is interlab comparison. And what that means is in order to do proficiency testing, you have to be comparing your personnel, your testers to people not in your lab. So you're comparing them to people in other labs. Okay, so that is interlab comparison. Proficiency, uh, proficiency testing is not product quality testing. So I see non-conformances on audit reports where you got a non-conformance for no proficiency testing for sensory. Well, sensory goes back to food quality um, and not food safety. So proficiency testing is only applicable for food safety testing. And it could be product, it could be environmental. Um, and then proficiency testing is not for testing that's, that's sent out to a third party. So think about your uh, environmental swabs. So obviously the person that's doing your swabs have to be trained to do your swabs, but they don't get involved in proficiency testing because you're sending those swabs out to another lab. So it's only conducted for testing completed on site um, and it would not be for the, the swabbing or you know, some of those quick test swabbing that, that you do there on site. So um, it, would do, it would be, again, for that food safety testing that you are actually doing the test on, um, so not quality testing. So just lots of confusion around that. So hopefully I clear, cleared that up a little bit for you. Um, and then as far as, you know, just the, re the new requirement for your internal lab to um, comply with some of those 17025 uh, requirements, just think good lab practices, you know, you know, records and having test methods, you know, spelled out so that you're making sure everybody's um, doing things the right way. Uh, so just think good lab practices and, and you'll be fine. Um, but SQFI does have some um, new guidance coming out on that. So you'll be able to see a, a fact sheet uh, very soon that will be a, available on our website that, that will help uh, with things like food safety culture and, and the new ISO uh, 17025 uh, uh, reference as well. So um, Brian, anything else? Um, you know, what about proficiency testing on your end as an auditor? Do you, do you see you know, some misunderstandings there? Yeah, I, I do. I mean, for the most part, folks are pretty good about, you know, following the requirements in it to 17025 lab. But I think with the new definition and, and your wonderful chart here, I, it'll help them understand it more clearly and then, you know, move themselves and clients and, and just help continuous improvement on their end and, and uh, making, making things better. All right, so I think I have one more slide and then I'm going to hand that back off to Brian. So, you know, some of the best practices, you know, doing a gap analysis from edition 8.1 to 9, you know, implementing some corrective actions. Brian mentioned earlier internal audits. That's a great way um, to, to see where your gaps are and to get those corrective actions. Um, SQF practitioner meetings, so making sure you're updating um, your senior site management on changes uh, coming up for edition nine, um, you know, making sure that SQF is just a priority from top management all the way down, um, just making sure everybody's involved in that process, um, using a third party to help with or verify compliance, and then celebrate your success and be ready for that May uh, implementation date. And I'm going to let Brian explain to you how your offends as a third party can help you with that um, next to the last bullet point there, uh, and then I'll let him close us out. Yeah, thank you, Tammy. So as everybody's has seen, there's a lot of information here and in, in you can look at the clock also. So your offense, we're here to, to offer help or need to to help, you know, sites get to that addition nine level. Um, if you need help, of course, we have we have, you know, consulting services, pre-assessment services. Um, you just want help to point you in the right direction of where the codes are. We're here for that. So we're, we're here to help you guys out um, to be successful, because if you're successful, we're successful. SQF successful, everybody's successful. 
so we're here to to be that partner um, to you know just help everybody get to where they need to be. Um, so just real quick, thank you, Tammy and SQF for taking time out of your busy time schedules to help us out. Some information here, just if you need more help, um, just a quick contact. So you got myself, my email address there. You've got Tammy's um, email address. So if you have questions for, for either of us or both of us, you're welcome to send those over to us. And then of course, the SQF website link there to download the code. So if you go on the SQF website, on their main screen, you scroll down, download codes is right there, right? So you don't have to look for it. It's pretty pretty front and center for you. Um, right now you can download 8.1 or 9, but just click on the 9.0 button and it has all those pretty pictures that Tammy showed us. Um, and just download the one you want and all the information is there for you. So it's a really great, great uh, website. And again, just, just quickly talking about this, just some of the services we offer. Um, you know, food safety culture is a big topic. Um, right now, as Tammy said, so if you need help with that, we got some webinars coming up to talk about food safety culture, um, addition on training. Even if you need further training to, with your team or your your company, um, we're, we're happy to step in and, and offer a you know a training personalized for your your facility or um, just one on one training. Uh, last poll question: Would you like someone to contact you after this? And I know we there's not much time, so. That poll question's up, and as you're answering that, just yes or no, um, just send those questions after the fact, or, or let us know, and we'll reach out to you with any questions you have specific to your needs, specific to your operation, and myself or Tammy or both of us will answer those questions to you personally. So just answer yes, if so, um, we'll go ahead and reach out to you as soon as, you know, this week to when this webinar is over to, you know, to help you out where we can and, and point you in the right direction, <clears throat> like, like Tammy said, to make you a success. Very good. So with that, as we're closing up this poll, I just want to, uh, we, we have time for uh, maybe a couple of questions. So we have any questions uh, right off the bat, Kelly? Yep. Uh, first of all, thank you, Tammy and Brian, for your presentation. Okay, the first question we have is, our audit is due on May 26. Should we be preparing from the addition nine point of view? Um, yeah, quickly. So I told I had a webinar late last year and I told them that if you have you're in the middle of the window there. So your window starts May 26, for example, it could be an 8.1 or 9.0 audit. And as bad as it is, you almost have to prepare for, for both or just prepare for 9.0 and make sure it meets all the requirements of 8.1. And if the numbers are different, the numbers are different. And like Tammy said, you don't have to put the numbers in there. So you just need to prepare for, for both, unfortunately, because unless, like, like she said, if you work with your CB and try to get on one side or the other of that window, um, so you know exactly what it's gonna be. Um, so it's a, it's a tough question to answer, but that's, that's what I can say is you just have to prepare for both. And if that's prepared for 9.0, that covers you know, everything that's in 8.1, but it should, it should cover you if you're prepared for 9.0. Okay, next question. Do we need to do internal audits or does the F SQF audit meet this requirement? Tammy, would you like to take this question? I would absolutely like to take that question. Uh, internal audits are mandatory. So they, you are, you know, you have to do an internal audit. And um, that's, you know, that's one of the requirements that I see where people um, just don't fully comprehend what an internal audit is. So, you know, they will, they will, you know, do a great job of covering the physical inspection of the plant. Um, but what an internal audit is, is looking at everything that an SQF auditor would be looking at. So you would be doing that internally and uh, having people trained to be internal auditors. And uh, so, so yeah, so that is a requirement. Um, and, and it has to be done at a minimum of annually. So um, I've seen sites that will, you know, do a little piece of the SQF code every month. I've seen, you know, lots of sites that just save up and once a year they do an internal audit. Um, so uh, we don't specify how you meet that minimum annual requirement um, for covering the entire code. Um, but, you know, you, you have some leeway there, but it is a requirement. You have to have that. Perfect, thank you, Tammy. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and, and shut it off.
uh, for that. I do appreciate everybody jumping on the call and I appreciate Tammy with her, all her hard work and SQFI for all their support. But like I said, if you have any further questions, just you know, feel free to reach out to us. Myself or Tammy will be will you know be happy to to help you out where we can. And thank you again, everybody, for for jumping on the call with us today. Enjoy your day.